very own dear husband to give us the word for today. We appreciate you. We value you and we honor you, sir. Karibu sana. Good morning. Um Thank you, sweetheart, and thank you, choir, for as well leading us well in the ministration of praise and worship, even in music. I believe that as, um, as we continue, we shall all learn and be edified, even by the coming forth of the word. I trust that we are even faithful stewards of the word. Amen? So as we learn, we started two weeks ago about the heart of Jesus, which is actually the heart of God for the lost. The heart of Jesus for the lost and the heart of God for the lost is big, is relentless, is extravagant, is patient. Praise the Lord. And I told us that we shall continue even with that today. And uh, as we continue, I want us to know that it is necessary that a redeemer possesses qualities better than that of the person he is redeeming. I want that to sink in well. It is important that a redeemer possesses qualities better than those of the person he is redeeming. That is why they are called a redeemer because in them is the ability that another does not possess. Otherwise, if you have a weak person functioning as the redeemer, then there will be no redemption. So it was necessary that in our Savior, Jesus Christ, are qualities that indeed justify him as redeemer. Praise the Lord. And I want us to look at that because that is what makes his heart steadfast. Because one that is not sure of their qualities will not provide the perfect duty. Whether they are in redemption duty, whether they are in any duty, if they are not sure of what they have, they won't do it. But it's important to know that Jesus is the only way to God. The only way to God. And because he is the only way, then it was necessary that the only way is well paved. In the world, people complain about how bad the roads are, and then they go an extra mile to say, and imagine this is the only access road to this place, but it is a bad road. So it means people will not have a good time traveling because the only access road is not good enough. But when you find that the only access road is big enough, well made, with the right, uh, uh, with the right demarcations and the right partitions, maybe it's duo and maybe it is, it is multiple carriage, people will have a good time traveling because the road is good enough. But when the road is not good enough, then people struggle. The good news that we have is that Jesus, our only way to God, the Father, is good enough. Praise the Lord. And I want us to start in the book of John chapter 14. John chapter 14. Let me start from verse 1. Scripture says, Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. 
In my father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I got to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself. That where I am, there you may be also. And where I go, you know. And the way, you know. Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you are going. And how can we know the way? Now listen to verse 6. Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. That is very important. Praise the Lord. That is very important. Thomas is asking, yeah, we do not know where you are going. How can we know the way? Previously, he had just told them that you know the way. And yet, because they are not sure that Jesus is indeed the way, they are not sure that what he's speaking about is actually the reality. Now, what does he tell them? He tells them, I am the way. He tells them, I am the truth. And then he tells them, I am the life. So no one comes to the Father except through me. That is a very important statement so that even as you are told on Sundays, even as you are told on Tuesdays, even as you are told on Thursdays, on Fridays, on Saturdays, every day you know that the only message you ought to feed onto is the message Christ Jesus. Praise the Lord. The same way you cannot take a certain road when you're going to a certain place because it does not lead you there. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. If you right now want to go to town, will you take the other airport road? No, because it won't lead you to town. Now Jesus tells us that no one comes to the Father except through me because he's the way. So it means everyone that wants to get to the Father, the only way is Christ Jesus. In the book of 1 Timothy chapter 2, Paul tells Timothy that Christ Jesus is the only one mediator between God and man. Let me show that to us, 1 Timothy chapter 2. And I will read from verse, uh, let me start from verse 1. My emphasis will be on verse 5. Scripture says, Therefore I exhort first of all that all supplications, Prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men. For kings and all who are in authority, that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and reverence. Why? Because this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who desires all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. This we shall come back to it, verse 4, we shall come back to it later on. Yet two weeks ago we saw it. Verse 5 says, For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man, Christ Jesus. Let me repeat verse 5. For there is one God and one mediator between God and men. Who is that? The man, Christ Jesus. So how many mediators do we have? And yet people keep saying, send so and so, pray for us. Send so and so, pray for us. Those are in error because as far as connection with the Father, the God, the creator of the heaven and earth is concerned, only one mediator. And who is that? The man, Christ Jesus. Praise the Lord. So only one mediator. I'm saying it is important that the person who is spoken of as the only way, possesses the quality well and good enough to justify him as the one that directs us even unto eternal life. And I want to give you good news, saints, that once you have received that man, you have received life. Because in him is life. Once you have him, you have life. Anyone that does not have that man, unfortunately, they don't have life. They may be walking and they may be breathing, but this breath doesn't signify life. I usually tell us always and always that you only started living the moment you believed Christ Jesus. So there is only one mediator between God and man. Who is that? The man, Christ Jesus. And the same, even Peter speaks about it in the book of Acts, the book of Acts, 
Maybe we can go there, the book of Acts chapter 4. And this is the theme for our word experience. I've heard all along the programmers have not been telling us about the theme for our word experience. The theme for our word experience is from the book of Acts chapter 4 and verse 12. Now we can read there together. Scripture says, Nor is there salvation in any other. Salvation, I have said, your Redeemer has to possess the qualities good enough that when they redeem you, they have enough in their reservoirs. And that is what our God had. Mind you, saints, when Jesus was saving us, that was God himself. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, Scripture says, God was in Christ reconciling us back to him. You'll go back and read that from the book of 2 Corinthians chapter 5 from verse 17. That God was in man, reconcile, uh, God was in Christ Jesus reconciling us back to him. Verse 12, the book of uh, Acts of the Apostles, chapter 4, scripture says, Nor is there salvation in any other, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. Praise the Lord. Now, knowing that we have only one name, if that one name messes up, our destiny is messed up. Because there is only one name. Praise the Lord. That is why it is important that the heart of Jesus for the lost is well understood because there is no alternative. I don't know if saints you're getting what I'm trying to drive home. Because we have only one name, because we have only the way, because we have only one mediator, the man Christ Jesus, it's important that the heart of that man is so perfect because there is no alternative. The people that will always relax are them that have alternatives. As for us, we have no alternative. So it's important to understand the heart of Jesus because apart from him, there is no other. Praise the Lord. So there is no salvation in any other. So it means, once his heart is not perfect, then we have no destiny. Or we are doomed for destruction. But we thank God, even as we started two weeks ago, that the heart of our Savior Jesus Christ is so perfect. Praise the Lord. See, he says that no one comes to the Father except through me. What does it mean? It means in us relating with the Father, it is through Christ Jesus. Now, when we understand the heart of the Father, then that should give us an idea of the mediator. Because the mediator has the interest of the person that he is mediating for. Amanam Nagani. The mediator ought to have the interest of the person they are mediating for. Now, because Jesus is the way to the Father, then it means we, he ought to have the heart of the Father. Meaning, the heart of God for the lost is the heart of Jesus for the lost. Why? Because Jesus' interests are for the Father. And we shall see that towards the end. But I want us to see in the book of Ezekiel chapter 33. Ezekiel Chapter 33, praise the Lord, hallelujah. Ezekiel chapter 33, and um, let's read verse 11, Ezekiel 33, 11, scripture says, Say to them, this is God speaking even through the prophet Ezekiel, he says, Say to them, as I live, says the Lord God, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that the wicked turn from his way and live. Turn, turn from your evil ways, for why should you die, O house of Israel? This is a speech of a man that is compassionate, and that is what we have seen in verse 3 of First Timothy chapter 2. Maybe now, with that understanding, we can go there. First Timothy chapter 2 and verse 3. I told us we shall come back to it. First Timothy chapter 2 and verse 3. 1 Timothy 2, 
3. He has said, For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, that prayers should be made. Verse 4. Who desires all men. Listen. He desires all men to do what? To be saved. So he does not desire a few. We saw this two weeks ago. To be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. Now let's go back to verse 11 of chapter 33, the book of Ezekiel. He says, say to them as I leave. So Timothy was being quoted for by Paul from Ezekiel. So the heart of God has been the same all along. It hasn't changed. Friends, the heart of God when you were dead in your sins was the same as the, his heart right now. He hasn't changed his mind about you. And that you should settle it in your heart that God has not changed his mind about you. Maybe your understanding of him might have faded because of your laxity. Maybe your understanding, your relationship with him has maybe deteriorated because of your laxity. He hasn't changed his position. He says, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked. That is the heart of God. So we do not celebrate the downfall of what people usually call enemies. And yet we've understood that our enemy is not human. The humans are just vessels of the enemy, Satan. So as much as you are interested in casting the enemy away, you're not casting out an individual. Because the individual is just a vessel that maybe has yielded to the wiles and the vials of the devil. But the man in themselves, they are not the wicked one. They are just carriers and vessels of the wicked one. But they are not wicked in themselves. And that is why when they learn the word of God, they are transformed. So he says, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that the wicked turn from his way and leave. Then he says, turn, turn. He says that twice. That is how dear it is to him that the wicked turn from their wicked ways. So he says, turn from your evil ways. For why should you die? You see someone tending a deadly path and then you, you ask yourself, why should such an individual end up in destruction? And yet justification has been provided. So he says, for why should you die, O house of Israel? So God is so, so, so touched when man is seemingly on the path to destruction. Let me prove that to you because this was speech, but we know that God appeared even in the flesh, right? In the person of Christ Jesus. Now, Christ Jesus himself, scripture reports of him as even shedding tears because men were attending to death and tending to destruction. Let me show that to us in the book of Matthew, chapter 9. Matthew, chapter 9. And I'll read four verses from verse 35. Matthew, chapter 9, from verse 35. Scripture says, Then Jesus went about all the cities and the villages, teaching in their synagogues, preaching the gospel of the kingdom, and healing every sickness and every disease among the people. Verse 36. But when he saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion for them. Why? Because they were weary and scattered like sheep having no shepherd. But when he saw, verse 36 again, but when he saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion for them. You have a, a, a savior that carries the very heart of God. We've just seen in chapter 33 verse 11 that he says, turn, turn from your evil ways. For why should you die, O house of Israel? And so Jesus looks at them that are scattered and weary as though they have no shepherd. And then he had compassion. On him. Other versions will 
show you what that compassion actually meant. He had compassion on them. And this is what he says in verse 37. Then he said to his disciples, the harvest is truly plentiful. What does he see? When he sees a person tending to death, he sees potential saved ones. And yet many people these days, when they see people tending to death, they see people that have no hope, people that have no future. This is what he says to his disciples. The harvest is truly plentiful, but the laborers are few. 38, therefore pray the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. He looks at them that are weary. He looks at them that are scattered as harvest. Praise the Lord. That is the harvest. Known for those that are good. So the heart of God, which happens to be the heart of Jesus, is that when he sees the weary, when he sees the scattered, he sees a harvest. Why? Because he desires that no one dies in their wickedness. The book of Luke chapter 19. The book of Luke chapter 19. I read two verses from verse 41. 1941 scripture says, Now as he drew near, he saw the city and wept over it. Why? Saying, if you had known, even you, especially in this your day, the things that make for your peace, but now they are hidden from your eyes. He sees a city that is scattered in their wickedness, scattered in their stupidity, scattered in their sins, scattered in their transgressions, and he weeps over that city. In his weeping, what does he say? He says, if you had known, even you, for this is good and acceptable in the sight of God, who desires all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. Isn't that what we have seen in 1 Timothy chapter 2? That has been the heart of the Father all through. So he says, if you had known, even you, especially in this your day, the things that make for your peace, but now they are hidden from your eyes. So Jesus weeps over Jerusalem. Why? Because these are people for whom God has been functioning, dealing with them as special. And yet when salvation has appeared, they seem like they are so distant from the salvation which is of God. It pains God that the man that he has dealt bountifully with, with, that is what he says in the book of Isaiah, Psalms, in Psalms he says, you've dealt with me bountifully. That is what we've been looking at on Tuesday, Psalm 119. You've dealt with me bountifully. And yet even after dealing with them bountifully, they have not known even the things that make for their peace. Why? Because they are hidden from their eyes. It touches the heart of God. So what was Jesus saying? They are scattered and weary. So biologically, they are expected to know the truth by default because they are relatives even to Jesus. And yet, they have not. And yet they have not. So it touches the heart of Jesus. Because his heart is that all men come to the knowledge of the truth. The question I want to pose for us is that do you learn from the heart of God that your heart is as well like that? The heart of a believer ought to beat for souls. The heart of a believer ought to beat that all come to the knowledge of the truth. Before you think of way out there, right from amongst us, even from yourself, praise the Lord, because he desires that all men come to the knowledge of the truth. Now I want you to imagine God shedding te tears over those that are rejecting him, over those that have not accepted him. Even the strong cry. The matter is not the tears, the matter is the cause for the tears. Praise the Lord. 
Hallelujah. If that, if, if his heart for men does not translate into your heart for men, that it translates into, into like where you are not even moved. Ah, let everyone live how they want. No, that is not how we are because our God wasn't like that. His heart beat for men that men come to the knowledge of the truth. And that is what he has directed us to do. That is why he sent us to make them his disciples. That they may learn his heart. And because he, he loves them, their disobedience moves him to tears. Because he's a loving God. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Now, he's moved because of his love. Not just because of our evil. Friends, he wasn't shedding tears because they were so full of evil. No. He was, shed, he was moved to tears. Let me show that again to us. Verse 41, chapter 19, the book of Luke. He wept over it. The cause for his weeping was that they had not known the things that make for their peace. Isn't Christ Jesus our peace? Right? So he's the one that makes for their peace and yet they had not known him. So what was moving him to tears was that he is our peace and yet we have not known. So it is his nature that moves him to that compassion, not just the things that we have done. So what I want to drive home and I want us to understand it, that our evil cannot diminish his heart for us. And yet... Even our goodness cannot increase his heart for us. Understand this. Eh? You know, some people tend to think that God loves them less because of their evil. That is not true. Scripture says Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. 13.8 of Hebrews. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. And yet in the beginning, he was with God and he is God. That is actually what John 1 means. That he existed from the beginning. Meaning, right from the beginning that is who he was. So it means, whether we do good, he won't say, yeah, I love you more because you have done good. No, it is his love. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. So our evil cannot diminish his heart or his love for us. And neither will our goodness increase his heart or his love for us. That means our God, that is indeed our Jesus, he doesn't love us more if we succeed. Neither does he love us less if we fail. Those are important statements because the heart of a father will remain constant regardless. Yesterday I was watching something of a 10-year-old that is, um, that is on trial for murder. This is a young girl, 10 years, who was in a foster family and he had mental issues, but they were not addressed. And so she was left in charge of a six-month-old. The six-month-old slipped out of her hands and she, and, he, and he or she fell on the floor. Now because of the pain, the six-month-old started crying terribly, terribly, terribly. Now the 10-year-old, her mental incapacitation started kicking in. Now she didn't know what to do to make the baby quiet. So she started stomping on the baby's head. Be quiet. In her mind, She's trying to tell the baby to be quiet. The baby died. And that is the report she gave. She said, the baby fell off out of my hands. She fell down. Now I was trying to make the baby be quiet. She's on trial for murder. And I was seeing as they were taking her, 10 year old, in handcuffs. But the parents were still around her. Because the love of a father, the love of a father will remain. That is what I'm saying. They do not love that young girl less 
because of what she did. They remain that blood relationship. And now if blood relationship will go to that extent, how much more our maker? So he doesn't love us more if we succeed. Neither does he love us less if we fail. That is his heart. Praise the Lord. And so if you, if you are trying to buy love, kwa kutumia matendo yako, utachoka. Praise the Lord. Utachoka. And so it also means your wrong deeds do not increase his love. You know, that is what many people fail now. They think that because God does not love us because of the good we have done, they automatically think that, okay, now, acha tutende mabaya, ili akaweze kutupenda. Hapana, he doesn't work like that. He loves you. That is the standard. Not because of your bad, not because of your good. He says in Titus, when the love of God appeared, not because of the things that we had done. Not because of the things that we had done. That is his heart. And now that brings us to this question. How is Jesus, in his power, able to remain that way toward us, regardless of our infirmities? How is our Jesus, in his power, because when we started from uh, uh, John 14, he said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. In his truth, in his being the way, in his being life, and yet he's dealing with people that are weary, scattered, as though without a shepherd, not heeding to the time of their visitation. Actually, let me just show you something towards the end of, uh, uh, we've been in verse 41 and 42 of Luke 19. Before we answer the question, let me show you something. In, 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 in verse 43 and 44. For days will come upon you, that is after weeping over Jerusalem and saying, if you had known the things that make for your peace. Now in verse 43 it says, for days will come upon you when your enemies will build an embankment around you, surround you and close you in on every side and level you and your children within you to the ground and they will not leave in you one stone upon another. Why? Because you did not know the time of your visitation. It's important that saints you are alert. Because you are, you, when, you, when, you, when you miss the knowledge of God, you might keep saying, you know, I don't know why God does not love me. But he has loved you and that is why he has sent scripture to you. You have been told severally. But you're hidden. He says, the enemy, the day, the enemy will level you and your children, verse 44, to the ground. They will not leave in you one stone upon another. They will not leave any stone unturned. Why? Because you did not know the time of your visitation. That is what he says in the book of Ephesians, chapter 5. Let me just refer that to us so that it might make sense even the more to us. Praise the Lord. He says in verse 15, See then that you walk circumspectly not as fools, but as wise. See then that you walk circumspectly not as fools, but as wise. What do you do? You redeem the time. Why? Because the days are evil. You redeem the time. Because you understand the time of your visitations. You understand the days of your visitation. Saints, it's important that the believer understands that even to the glory which is of God in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Now, let's go back to our question. The question is, how is Jesus in his power able to remain that loving, not moved by our infirmities, not moved by the good things that we try to do? How does he remain that way toward us, regardless of our infirmities? That is the thing I told us when we were starting, that a redeemer must possess qualities that exceed and excel the person they are to redeem and the situation that is holding them that he's redeeming captive. Because if the redeemer does not have the ability, then the redeemer will end up like the captive. You've heard of stories of when people drown. And as reports are given, they are like, there are four people that drowned. They were in that boat 
and the and the waters were ravaging and the boat capsized but then there were people that were on the shores one of them swam to go and rescue them unfortunately he did not make it so we have four casualties you know why it is like that it is because the person that was going to save them did not have enough resources enough ability within them to save them we thank god that when jesus was dying his death was enough because we have seen people that their health does not meet the threshold they have tried their best but it hasn't met the threshold and so it appears like there was no help at all but as for our jesus he is able to remain focused because there is something that he possesses in him that defines his heart and that is the question that we want to answer in these few minutes that are left i pray we are able to finish number 1 he is pure jesus is pure in the book of first peter chapter 1 and verse 18 first peter chapter 1 and verse 18 scripture says knowing that you were not redeemed with corruptible things like silver or gold from your aimless conduct received by tradition from your father listen let me repeat verse 18 again knowing that you were not redeemed with corruptible things because if you were redeemed with corruptible things then your redemption would not last are we together and the reason why our redemption lasts is because of the quality of him that has redeemed us so he says knowing that you were not redeemed with corruptible things like silver or gold from your aimless conduct which is received by tradition from your fathers verse 19 but with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot the keywords i want you to take there are without blemish without spot praise the lord hallelujah so in christ jesus is no blemish no spot that is why no matter the 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 tides he remains steadfast it's important that you that is in the place of rid, of of the redeemer you are pure and that is why god has made you that he says in jude i believe that to the pure believe it is let me just confirm for us because i want us to take it home um Eh oh mm. Okay I wish I could find it Where he says that to the pure all things are pure should be in Jude as well i'll find it for those of you that will be there in second service i believe the spirit of god will show it to us then anyway, it is well the book of first john chapter 3 and verse 5 first john chapter 3 and verse 5 scripture says that whoever abides in him does not sin whoever sins has never has neither uh, sorry verse 5 not 6 and you know that he was manifested to take away our sins and in him there is no sin the key words there are and in him there is no sin that is the nature of our god that is why he remains steadfast because in him there is no sin we have seen in verse 18 and 19 that you are not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold but with the precious blood of Christ Jesus as of a lamb without blemish and without spot so he is pure because in him there is no sin now the purpose of Jesus which is to save mankind required this very important trait praise the lord 
And so now we can be sure about his heart because we know his nature. His nature is that he is pure. So we can be sure that his heart for the lost will not change. Because in him there is no shadow of That is what I've said, that the Savior, the Redeemer, must possess qualities higher than the person they are redeeming and the situation that is holding the, the captives captive. You see what Jesus said in verse 14, Matthew chapter 15. Matthew chapter 15. Matthew chapter 15. Praise the Lord. Matthew chapter 15. If you go back, I want you to go back and read from verse 1. Eh? He was speaking about men being, uh, being careful. The things that they let fill their heart. That then they are able to speak out of the abundance of those things. Because he was teaching them that, you know what? The things that you let in do not necessarily defile you. But the things that come out of you. Because you may not have uh, you may not have a say on what happens. Like now, if if our neighbors, the other side, we know what happens there. If they choose to start now, we can't stop them. But we can determine whether we shall pay attention to them, that then that, is, that will be our manifestation or not. And now the Pharisees, because they were so so glued on outward functioning, they were offended by that. And so in verse 12, the disciples came and said to him, do you know that the Pharisees were offended when they heard this saying? Verse 14 says, because he was telling them that they are so good at speaking. He told them, these people draw near me with their lips but their hearts are so far away from me. And then they were offended. Verse 13, Jesus say, answers. But he answered and said, Every plant which my heavenly father has not planted will be uprooted. Listen, verse 14. Let them alone. They are blind leaders of the blind. This is what I want to make sense to you. That the redeemer ought to be better than the people they are redeeming. The Redeemer ought to possess qualities much better than the people they are redeeming and much greater than the situation from which they are redeeming the people. Otherwise, they will all end up the same way. So Jesus says, let them alone. They are blind leaders of the blind. And if the blind leads the blind, both will fall into a ditch. We are sure we can't fall into a ditch because the heart of Jesus is a heart from a pure conscience. I pray for you that you will be able to discern your visitation. That then you won't be blind. Because if you lead your mind blindly, where you end up is in a ditch. That is not your portion. Number two, we've said number one, he is pure. Number two, he is peaceful. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. There are around five instances and I want us to uh, go and look at them. Of course, we shall expound on them in future. But instances where the disciples were fretting, where the disciples were saying, we are finished, but he remains at peace. You remember when he preached by the lakeside and then people had traveled for, uh, even in the wilderness, two instances, actually three. They had traveled and then three days later they had been with him and then they the disciples are saying, now go away. He tells them, no, these people have been with me for three days. How can I leave them when they are hungry? They might faint along the way in the wilderness. They might faint along the way. And then they are saying, we have no food. We don't even have enough money. And then Jesus says, what do you have? He is so peaceful that when they are fretting about how should we, how are we going to feed? He says, what do we have? The heart of Jesus is, let what we have be enough. They are not saying, hey, what do we have? We don't have. Well, because that is what many people fret about. There are many people that spend a lot of their time fretting about things that are to no avail. 
You won't be like that. Praise the Lord. The second instance is when he tells them, let us cross over to the other side. And that is what people miss because they don't listen to Jesus. He told them, let us cross over to the other side. We've just heard here, the choir was saying, Akisema, Anatenda. He is not man that he should lie. Jesus had told them, let us cross over to the other side. So whatever happens, hapo katikati, does not matter. Because we know, he said, we are crossing over to the other side. So you storms come. Our master has said, we are crossing over to the other side. But if you're not peaceful, you will forget what he has said. And these things, hapa katikati, will disturb your mind. He's able to remain on course. He's able to remain with a heart for the lost because he's peaceful. So when they were fretting about the storm in the sea, he, he, he was even sleeping. Sometimes you can say, but that pastor, he does not care. Things are happening like this. Like in yeah, yeah, he does not care. Our master, Jesus Christ, at a time when people appeared like, hey, the storm is finishing us. When they found him, he was sleeping. He's the kind that is able to rest when no one else can rest. He's at peace. Praise the Lord. And after waking up, he raises his arm and the storm quietened. And then he asks them, where is your faith? Because in the faith of Christ Jesus, we have uh, peace. Another example was in the book of John. He spoke and taught so well that from that moment, Scripture says, many of his disciples ceased to walk with him. You go back and see that in John chapter 6. Many of his disciples stopped walking with him. And that happens. That will happen. And he will stop walking with you. Did he fret? No, he did not fret. He remained at peace. He remained at peace. He did not start cursing them when they left. He did not start because he was at peace. You remember even when he was rejected, scripture says he went to another city, teaching and preaching. That is a heart of one who knows what he sent for. Praise the Lord. Another example was at his crucifixion. When the, when, the, when, the, when the soldiers, the Roman soldiers were, were accusing him, they beat him, they spat on him, they put a, th a throne of, uh, what do they, a crown of thorns on him, and all of those things. He had power. He did not invoke his power to say, fire, come burn them. No, because he was at peace. As a minister, as a believer, things will happen to you. But because you are peaceable. You see, he said in 1 Timothy 2, where we started from, around there where we started from, that, that we may be able to live peaceably with all men. Because he's peaceful. Even when the soldiers mock him, he does not respond with a lot, with, with the way man would have responded. You might find individuals that when they, when they have, let me use this word, eh? small power like this, this place can burn. There are some people that if you give them small power, small authority, the house will burn. And yet our Jesus with all of his power, he was at peace. We can learn from of him because his heart for the lost could not afford him to change when they are spitting in his face. Because then he would call fire that the captors are burnt and then it means he would not die for us. He was disciplined enough. And then lastly, when Peter denied him. We, 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 <laughs> scripture says He looked back, and we saw that last Sunday. Uh, not Laurie. Nelvin was teaching us that last Sunday. 
Jesus just looked back after the cock had crawled and he looked at Peter. Scripture says, and then Peter remembered the words of Jesus. Sometimes you just, you just turn and look and let things go because you are exercising the peace of God which is in you. Jesus could, could just say, eh? and then Peter disappears just right there and then. But he just turned and looked at Peter to make him understand that I know and I remember what I said and it has come to pass. Now, your response toward that realization will define you. And I told us that that was the difference between Judas and Peter. As Peter went crying and repenting, Judas went looking for a tree to hang. That's the difference. Don't die. So Jesus refused to lose his temper because he was peaceful. He refused to respond with vengeance because he was peaceful. And why did he? It is because his heart was for the greater purpose. His heart was for the greater purpose. He had one goal. What was that goal? To save the lost. And that included you and me. And now it includes them that are out there. In the book of Luke chapter 19 and verse 10. That we looked at it two weeks ago. Luke chapter 19 and verse 10. When Jesus goes into Zacchaeus' house, he tells him in verse 9, and Jesus said to him, today salvation has come to this house because uh, he is also a son of Abraham. Verse 10. For the son of man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. His purpose defined his ways. And I want us to know, saints, that many times, many people are not at peace. And the reason is, they aim at nothing in particular. Like, I can just sample, if I ask, what is your aim for this week? What is your aim for today? Ama wewe unaishi tu. So you are not at peace because there is no focus. So many times, the reason why people are not at peace Always is because they aim at nothing in particular, so they have no, they have nothing to achieve. So this will disturb them. This opportunity will entice them. The other opportunity will entice them. This will disturb them. A small, a small, a small setback will bring them down because they have no focus. But if there is a goal that you have set, then no matter the obstacles, your purpose will be, how do I overcome these obstacles? But if you have no goal, then you'll be like, ah, hiyo imekataacha ni jaribu hii. Hata hiyo imekataacha ni kwa hii. Hata hiyo imekataacha ni kwa hii. Because hauna msima. Those are the people that you find, they are never at peace because they have no goal in life. You will struggle only because you live for nothing. You just live because there is breath. Jesus couldn't afford to live like that. So those people aim at nothing in particular to achieve it and therefore they are not at peace. They are worried. You see someone achieving something, you want to achieve it. You see another one achieving another thing, you also want to achieve it. You'll be like, lakini juhuyu tulisoma na yeye na ako hivi kumanisha sasa sinirika yangu. Okay, let me also try it. Then when it fails, you'll be like, ah, I think what did she do? Okay, let me try another one. Who you pia nirika yangu? And then you also try it. Before you realize you've wasted many years because you're trying this and the other, nothing in particular. And so such people are always trying this or the other, but nothing in particular. But our God, and that is our Jesus, would not have saved us if he had not focused on the task. And so that means we can learn from him even in how he discerned. Our Jesus was so focused that he knew when his time was not yet. And he knew when it was finished. In the book of John chapter 2, John chapter 2, when his mother comes to him as they were at the wedding in Cana and they had run out of wine, scripture says, in verse 3, 
And when they ran out of wine, the mother of Jesus said to him, They have no wine. Jesus said to her, Woman, what does your concern have to do with me? My hour has not yet come. That is someone who is focused, peaceful. Many people will say, Aha, now that is my opportunity, let me grab it. But he is so at peace that he knows when to say, My hour has not yet come. That same person who said, My hour has not yet come, he also knows when he has accomplished because he is focused and he knows his timelines. You will not see how much you have achieved if you do not set a standard. So you will not know whether there is any achievement or not. You will only live. Jesus knew his purpose. He knew his duty. He was focused. His heart for the lost. He knew when he had accomplished it. I can ask you, last week, what did you accomplish? Not that you really didn't accomplish anything, but because you had no purpose for the week, there is nothing that you can look at and say, this, I accomplished it. Because you had no plan whatsoever. I usually tease my leaders, this week, what have you done? What have you achieved? And then I, I see them trying to try to collect and recollect things and be like, did I do this? Did I? Because when they wake up, they have no plan whatsoever. You can't afford to live like that. Because you learn from the best. Praise the Lord. Now, see this same um, Jesus who in verse 4 of chapter 2, the book of John said, woman, what have your concern have to do with me? My hour has not yet come. He's disciplined. So that if you have your mind set on something, even the most enticing of opportunities will not derail you because you are purposed. In verse 30, the book of nine, uh, Luke, John, sorry, chapter 19, Jesus says, scripture says in verse 30, John 19, so when Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, it is finished. And bowing his head, he gave up his spirit. Let me repeat. So when Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, it is finished. And bowing his head, he gave up his spirit. Some of you do not even know when you've accomplished the things that you started. Because when you started them, you had no goal. So you can keep on something that has already been done. Because you have no goal. Praise the Lord. And so our Jesus is able to be perfect because he is, uh, he is peaceful. When there is peace, you can be able to plan. Number one, we said he's pure. Number two, we have said he's peaceful. Number three, he is spiritual. Friends, your heart for men can only be glued when you have an everlasting intimate relationship. With the Father. There is a reason why I'm adding everlasting. Because for some of us, we are relation, we are feeling based in our relationship. Today I feel good, tomorrow I don't. To, today I feel I am in love with the Lord, tomorrow I don't feel like. Today I am so psyched up for, for the work of ministry, tomorrow I don't feel like it. But Jesus was spiritual that he always had an everlasting intimate relationship with the Father. He says in the book of John, chapter 14 and verse 11, that he, that he is in the Father and the Father is in him. Can you say the same about yourself? Praise the Lord. 14, 11, he says, Believe in me that I am in the Father and the Father in me. Or else believe me for the sake of the works themselves. Praise the Lord. And so because he was in the Father and the Father was in him, even every step of the way, was directed by the Father. Let me show you this in the book of Matthew, chapter 4. This is when he was led into the wilderness for prayer and for fasting. Verse 1. Then Jesus was led up by the Spirit. That is a spiritual man. He says in the book of Romans that for as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. So, 
he was led by the spirit. Praise the Lord. He was led by the spirit. In the book of Luke chapter 4, we are speaking about Jesus being spiritual. Verse number 1, scripture says, Then Jesus being filled with the Holy Spirit. Being filled with the Holy Spirit. You'll see in other versions when they say, Being full of the Holy Spirit. That is what keeps him at peace, regardless of our infirmities. That is what keeps his heart constant toward us. And he went in the spirit, that is the mirror account of chapter 4, Matthew. Luke chapter 4 is a mirror account of Matthew 4. Now, in verse 14 of Luke chapter 4 still, Jesus returned in the power of the spirit. He goes in the spirit, he comes back in the spirit. There are some, 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 some people that if they leave church for three days, they will come back and you can't understand them. And so you ask yourself, I, I, I thought I knew this person. They look so different now. Friends, it's important that you always remain in an everlasting, intimate relationship with the Father. So we see Jesus goes in the Spirit, comes back in the Spirit. Praise the Lord. Now, as a spiritual man, there are some things that are a habit. And these were the habits of Christ Jesus. There are some things that will not be separated, that you cannot be separated from as a spiritual man. Because that is what you are. Let's look at them in a way. Chapter 4, verse 16, the book of Luke. We've just been in 14, now let's go to 16. So he came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up. And as his custom, if that Bible is yours, underline that. A spiritual man has some things that are by default custom to them. Scripture says, and as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up to read. Fellowship to a person that is spiritual is not because they have time. It is not because they are not tired. It is not because church is near. No. It is not because they have bought clothes. No. It is not because they smile at them at church. No, it is because it is their custom. As a spiritual person, there are things that are a habit. And this was the habit of Christ Jesus. As his custom was, he went into the synagogue. So we learn from the best. His heart for the lost. He knew that in his coming, and so if you continue to read, he reads to them, and then he preaches to them because his heart is for them. The unfortunate bit is they didn't understand him. But still he taught them. Let's back it up to uh, verse 4. Verse 4. As the devil was saying, as if you are the son of God, command this stone to become bread, because he was, ang he was hungry. In verse 4 he said, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word of God. He was quoting Deuteronomy chapter 8. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word which comes from the mouth of God. So, a spiritual person, things that are normal to him, things that are his norm, are things like, as for me, I will always be alive because I depend on the, on the, on the word which is of God. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. And so in that relationship with the Lord, that relationship causes him to be guided. Praise the Lord. And so every time he had prayer, every time he was involved in prayer, his prayer time guided his next move. The reason why people have no ideas is because they don't pray. But in prayer, you relate with God and he teaches you how to go about things. 
I want you to cultivate a culture of prayer and it will show you ideas. You will come out of prayer and you know exactly what to do and when to do it. Let me give you an example even as I finish. In the book of Mark chapter 1, Mark chapter 1, praise the Lord, and in verse 30, let me start from verse 35. Now in the morning, having risen a long while before daylight, he went out and departed to a solitary place. Some of you, even when we tell you here to pray, you look at us. And yet Jesus was able to de discipline himself to pray solitarily, in solitary, alone. In a solitary pr place, and there he prayed. And Simon and those who were with him searched for him. When they found him, they said to him, everyone is looking for you. Verse 38, pay attention. But he said to them, let us go into the next towns that I may preach there also, because for this purpose I have come forth. This could not have come as a mistake. He was in prayer. People waiting for him. Some others, because they are not led by the Spirit, they will say, but he tells them, let us go to the next town. His prayer life inspired his next move. So he could be able to change course of the disciples telling him, you know, come, we go. They are waiting for you. And he would just tell them, let us go to the next time, town. So it is his prayer line, life and his prayer time that guided him. In the book of Luke chapter 6, the book of Luke chapter 6, praise the Lord. In the book of Luke chapter 6, let's start from verse 12. Now it came to pass in those days that he went out to the mountain to pray. I want you to see that important decisions were made as he prayed because he had a heart for men. He went out to the mountain to pray and continued all night in prayer to God. And when it was day, he called his disciples to himself. And from them he chose 12 whom he also named apostles. There are some serious decisions that you may not make unless you are settled in prayer. And those are definitive features for a person whose heart is for the lost. Praise the Lord. In the book of John chapter 5, he yielded to the Father. Same in John chapter 5 in verse 19 and in verse 30. He says, I do not do, in verse 19 chapter 5, he says, I do not do anything except I see my father do it. And in verse 30, he says, as my father does, so do I. That is someone that is disciplined and always led by the father. Why would he debase himself to that? It is because his focus and heart was for the lost. He loves you. And because he loves you, he wants you to understand his heart as well. And so my prayer for you this morning is that you will learn from this man, our Savior, Jesus Christ, in Jesus' name. I want us to be on our feet. And as we are on our feet, you've learned the heart of Jesus. He's able to remain steadfast, not moving, because he is pure, because he is peaceful because he is spiritual. And because that is what he is, he def it defines how he lives. Praise the Lord. So I want us to raise our voices even in prayer and speak to the Lord and tell him, Lord, my desire is to manifest exactly like you did. Tell him, raise your voice and tell him, Lord, my desire is to manifest exactly like you did. Thank you, Lord, that even as the saints in this place and those at home desire to manifest exactly like you did, by your spirit they do. I thank you, Lord. I thank you, Jesus. I give you praise in the name of Jesus because they manifest exactly like you do. In Jesus' mighty name. Amen. If you believe that, join your hands and give glory to the Lord. In Jesus' name. Amen.